Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bitter Pill. Uh, so, I tried to go live a few minutes ago and I screwed up big time. I actually forgot to turn on my mic. Uh, kind of an embarrassing uh, screw up. I you know I should always check that I'm actually getting sound. But hopefully everything's okay now. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today was this a uh, silly protest that I came across an announcement of uh, a, um, a couple of days ago. Uh, basically, um, sorry, that's not what I wanted to show you. The New York uh, branch of Socialist Alternative, uh, one of the uh, small uh, socialist groups that we have here in the United States, uh, organized or co-organized a protest uh, there in New York uh, in, quote, solidarity with the protesters risking jail or worse in China over rapidly worsening conditions for working people and greater repression from the CCP. Well, you know, there's several things to uh, say about this protest or this announcement. Uh, one is... Uh, I'm not sure what they're talking about when they say there are rapidly worsening conditions for working people in China. Uh, I mean, over the last four decades, four plus decades, China has had the fastest economic growth of any country in the world. Uh, it's gone from what, uh, even as late as the uh, late 1970s, uh, uh, it was a pretty poor country with uh, quite a bit of poverty. Um, even though you know, many improvements had been made uh, since the Chinese Revolution in 1949, uh, to a uh, pretty industrialized and uh, developed country uh, today, where uh, you know over the course of those last several decades, uh, the uh, combination of economic uh, growth uh, and uh, targeted policies by the uh, Chinese government. Uh, have resulted in, uh, in the, the uh, lifting of 800 million people out of extreme poverty. Uh, you know, even the UN uh, says that that happens and happened and compliments uh, China for it. And yeah, you know, there's still a long way to go. There's still people who are kind of you know, living on the edge of poverty, even though they, you know have a roof over their head and are not going hungry or anything like that because uh, the Chinese government you know, makes sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, unlike the United States, they don't have you know, tens of millions of people without uh, health care, uh, without health insurance. Um, so, you know, what rapidly worsening conditions for working people are uh, you talking about? Uh, socialist alternative NYC uh, they're rapidly improving conditions for working people in China um, a, a second thing that is noticeable about this announcement is the term uh, CCP um, that's the acronym uh, that you know people who are you know xenophobic or at least uh, you know, anti-communist uh, used to refer to the Chinese, uh, to the uh, Communist Party of China, which is, you know, abbreviated CPC. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, a um, anti-communist dog whistle, uh, or even xenophobic uh, dog whistle, that you see universally used by, um, you know, most of the Western political establishment, or you know, really all of the Western political establishment, and here it's also used by this uh, you know, socialist organization. Um, and you know, what exactly is it that they're uh, in solidarity with? Well, um, you know, as I mentioned uh, last time, there uh, were you know, protests. In a, in a small number of cities in China, um, let's see, I'm not sure if I have any uh, links to comments about those protests, but, you know, a, uh, 
small number of uh, cities in, in China uh, where um, you know, uh, really uh, not very many protesters uh, came out. Uh, there was, uh, oh, I thought I had it here, but I don't. Uh, there was uh, somebody who was pro uh, the protests, uh, you know, who said there were about 500 people uh, engaged in these anti-lockdown, anti-zero COVID protests in uh, China. I mean, excuse me, in uh, Shanghai. Um, and it's estimated that there were like a couple of thousand uh, such protesters nationwide in, in a you know, handful of cities. Um, you know, in a country that's 1.4 billion people. Uh, so these are very small scale protests. Um, and you know, as Angelo Giuliano says here, uh, one of the Shanghai protest organizers is uh, uh, somebody who backed the um, uh, Tiananmen Square protests in 1989, which, you know, of course, in the West have been widely portrayed as this uh, pro-democracy movement. But in fact, um, even though, uh, as I've talked about before, uh, there were legitimate demands in the protests that were... Uh, you know, labor activists who were demanding you know better uh, wages and treatment of workers and so forth, but also um, Western uh, you know, NGOs funded by the National Endowment for Democracy and by George Soros uh, played a big role in organizing that. Um, but uh, as uh, Angelo uh, says here, uh, the protests. Uh, organizers were largely uh, people based outside of mainland China, um, such as a YouTuber based in Australia, um, and you know, they were in constant communication during the lead up to the protest with Western uh, journalists, uh, and uh, you know, uh, this was not an organic uh, protest movement. Now, you know, granted there. There certainly is dissatisfaction uh, in China with certain elements of uh, China's uh, dynamic zero COVID policy. Uh, but uh, these protests turned into uh, you know, protests uh, where slogans like down with the CCP, down with uh, Xi Jinping, calling for the overthrow of the uh, Chinese government. Uh, those sorts of sentiments were uh, expressed. Um, and as I talked about last time, um, let me go back to socialist alternative here. Um, there are actually protests occurring, you know, all the time in China. Um, you know, there's uh, 1.4 billion people, as uh, this commentator here points out, and uh, you know people are going to be unhappy with things. You're not going to, you know, even if the government's trying, they're not going to please people 100% of the time. Uh, so you know, there actually are a lot of protests in China. It was estimated uh, by a uh, Chinese uh, sociologist a few years ago that there were hundreds of protests in China every day. You're not not over the course of a year, but every day. You know, most of them are small and localized. Uh, um, you know, against very specific things. Typically, uh, complaints about something the local government is doing, or local government officials that uh, haven't uh, been um, you know, resolved through dialogue. Uh, you know, so they protest, um, and you know, uh, things uh, generally get resolved, and you know, protesters are not uh, typically. <laughs> oppressed by the police. Actually, one thing that uh, Jerry uh, Gray, a, a fellow who's lived in China for 18 years, uh, was telling me uh, when I interviewed him the other day, is that, uh, you know, actually uh, people in China mostly have a very friendly relationship with the uh, police. It's not like here where you have more than a thousand people being uh, killed by the police every year. Um, but uh, 
you know, th these protests uh, over the the lockdowns were uh, just you know a, a uh, very sparsely uh, attended uh, set of uh, protests that uh, really weren't representative of you know the sentiments of most people in China who uh, certainly would like to see some changes uh, you know as have been made in uh, specific policies regarding COVID containment, but you know, are not uh, on board with just you know throwing out all the measures that have so successfully uh, contained COVID in uh, China. Um, so who are these uh, groups that uh, NYC uh, Socialist Alternative organized this protest with? Uh, you know, Hong Kong student advocacy groups, uh, uh, New Yorkers supporting Hong Kong, students for Hong Kong, students for free Tibet, uh, Iger American Association, uh, uh, Democ Democratic Party of China, which I believe is supposed to be Democracy Party of China, uh, et cetera. And these are all groups that uh, are, you know, in some respects, uh, you know, calling for uh, you know, backing s separatist movements uh, in uh, China. You know, uh, Tibet and Hong Kong and Taiwan and the uh, Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region in Western China are, are all places that have some degree of autonomy from the uh, central government. In fact, ta Taiwan is basically um, you know, completely separately uh, governed. Uh, you know, Hong Kong is governed by a party that isn't the Communist Party of China. Um, but you know, they're still considered part of China uh, by uh, basically every country in the world. Um, but, um, the U.S. has, uh, for decades now, been supporting groups that want to, uh, destabilize and dismember China. Um, you know, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is kind of the soft power, um, uh, version of the CIA, uh, you know, spends tens of millions of dollars every year. Uh, funding groups uh, in China that uh, you know, uh, want to undermine the Chinese government. Um, and two of the groups on this list, uh, I uh, noticed uh, the Iger American Association and Students for Free Tibet are in fact groups that are funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about uh, the others, but certainly these two. Um, and you know, what exactly are they protesting against? They're protesting against policies that have prevented millions of deaths from uh, COVID. Um, and as I think I said, uh, you know, the stereotype in the West of the policies that the Chinese government has had is, uh, oh, they've you know, locked people down in China for three years and uh, so on and so forth. And, you know, in fact, almost 80% of uh, uh, Chinese people have never ever experienced a lockdown. Uh, you know, lockdowns in China have been uh, very targeted to you know, specific cities where they've had significant outbreaks, uh, and you know most of the time, uh, people just uh, go about their daily lives without restraint. Uh, schools were back in session in person throughout China in fall of 2020. Um, you know, have you uh, can see you know, big gatherings of people you know uh, not wearing. Uh, masks, uh, you know, throughout China uh, during 2020 um, and uh, after, um, you know, because basically they had almost eliminated uh, COVID from China altogether through not just lockdowns, but, you know, a whole panoply of uh, measures, including uh, quarantining people who uh, come into the country until they can be sure that they don't have COVID, um, you know, having uh, people uh, you know, install apps on their phones that uh, you know, uh, enable them to uh, scan a QR code that they're given that indicates their uh, status uh, COVID-wise, such as whether or not they um, you know have tested positive for COVID recently. Um, you know, that gets you a you know a red uh, code, uh, and so uh, and on the other hand, if you uh, haven't even been around anybody uh, 
with COVID and you're in a low risk uh, neighborhood and so forth, you have a green code on your phone. Uh, so, you know, you can go anywhere without restriction. Uh, if you have a red code uh, on your phone, phone app, then uh, you're not allowed to enter public indoor spaces. Um, and you, this is a measure that certainly uh, a lot of us in the West uh, would have a problem with is a you know violation of uh, people's privacy or civil liberties or whatever. But uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, people in China are accepting of it uh, because uh, you know uh, it's um, you know a, a group-oriented culture where uh, people uh, care more about uh, you know the welfare of the community, such as whether or not uh, many of them are getting infected with a potentially uh, deadly disease uh, than they are about their own uh, individual liberty to do whatever they want. And secondly, uh, you, there, there's actually a lot of uh, trust of and support for uh, the Chinese government among uh, people in China. Uh, you know, a uh, poll uh, conducted by a... Um, a uh, group of sociologists uh, at Harvard has found year after year uh, you know, more than 90% support for the Chinese uh, government. Uh, there have also been polls that have you know, conducted uh, in 2020 that found that uh, uh, people uh, there overwhelmingly supported the Chinese government's uh, COVID policies. Um, and you know, granted, there might have been some uh, decline in support and increase in uh, criticism as we enter uh, almost uh, enter year three of the pandemic, uh, and you know there's still a fair bit of uh, you know uh, restrictiveness of uh, measures uh, to uh, contain COVID in China. Uh, you know, people don't want to be locked down anymore, um, but at the same time, you know people still uh, support. Uh, <laughs> not going the route of the West where millions of people have died from COVID. Um, but anyway, uh, this, this demonstration uh, is yet another example of uh, uh, Western leftists uh, sort of uh, aligning themselves with um, you know, the very same entities that uh, want to uh, undermine other countries, uh, you know, on behalf of the uh, U.S. government. Um, and, you know, that's not okay. Um, you know, I hope that uh, more Western leftists will be, you know, a little more discerning about, uh, you know, uh, their uh, stances on foreign policy. Um, you know, as I've talked about before, you know, we uh, similarly have uh, Western leftists, uh, you know, uh, calling for you know, arming the Ukrainian government, the uh, you know, fascist-dominated Ukrainian government, um, you know, a similar sort of uh, political uh, you know, lunacy for anybody who purports to be on the left. Um, all right, I will. Uh, that's about all I have to say for today. I will see you next.